Hello and welcome everyone who's joining um, joining us for this presentation, Vectors on the Move. We were working through some technical difficulties as seems to be the way these things sometimes go, but we are very happy to have you joining us. Thanks for not giving up. Um, and yeah, we have, we're presenting a couple of these menti polls. Um, if you could go to the address you see here on your screen and type in the code, then we can, um, it's a fun way to start our session to see where people are calling in from and a few other key facts for our audience as um, everyone trickles in. And please also note that in the chat, uh, you're welcome to add any questions or comments. My colleague Colin just put the, po the link to the Menti poll there. And be sure that you have everyone selected unless you want to do a personal uh, message directly to one individual. So while everyone's finding their way to those polls and we take get a sense of where you all are calling from, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Elizabeth Cloyce. I'm a public health advisor at the US Agency for International Development in the Office of Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition. Um, in, in a moment, I'll introduce a few of my other colleagues who will be speaking to you, but we'd like to welcome you to this session, Vectors on the Move, looking at the way climate change impacts vector-borne diseases. As many of you know, have heard, especially um, in light of the Leaders Summit on Climate yesterday and today, and acknowledgements of Earth Day yesterday, uh, climate change is impacting the planet in multiple ways. And of course, we all are especially interested in the ways that it impacts health and populations, especially um, the health of the populations that we work with across the globe. Um, one of the key ways, um, vector-borne diseases, we often think of malaria, and we'll be talking about that quite a bit. Although a lot of progress has been made in the past decades, still 220 million infections each year. Um, just one example of a statistic that you might be hearing some of. But we also want to address a few others. So we're curious about what diseases you all are working on. And we'll get some of those responses here in just a moment. Let's see. Colin, did you see a readout of where everyone's calling in from today? Yeah, hi Liz. It looks like most people are in the US um, and almost everybody was in DC. So I think we have a very US heavy crowd, but I assume we work all over the world, which you can probably um, pick up based on the vector-borne diseases we work on. Yes, and from the diseases that are popping up, um, chikungunya, Zika, it uh, is clear that these are a variety of other places. No one's mentioned Lyme disease yet, but here in the US, um, that's one uh, vector-borne disease that we are seeing impacts of the shifting, um, shifting ranges of. All right, very interesting. Yes, I see we've got a bunch of um, colleagues working on a variety of vector-borne diseases and I'm sure other health issues as well. So thank you everyone and again, welcome. Um, first, I'll introduce my colleague Colin, who you've briefly seen. Colin is a climate change advisor in the African Bureau at the US Agency for International Development. Um, and he'll be helping to facilitate the second part of our presentation in introducing some of our panelists. But first, I'd like to initially hand it over to Fernanda Zermoglio. Uh, Fernanda is a climate adaptation specialist in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, also at the US Agency for International Development. And she's gonna give us um, a presentation about some of the shifting, shifting zones of vector-borne diseases and a bit of the analysis, some country specific, but also some more broadly about um, some shifts in the patterns that we're seeing. So Fernanda, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Liz, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you're calling from. Um, I'm gonna, um, Emily, if she could share the slides. And uh, as she puts up the slides, I just want to say that at any time, if you have a question or if you'd like to share some of your own experiences with vectors on the move, um, particularly sort of respect, you know, responding to a changing climate, feel free to do so uh, within the chat, and we'll try to revisit that. Emily, are you available to show my slides? 
Yeah, um, I'm just hoping the uh, Tech Exchange support is still on so I can be a, a host and present my screen. Okay, so with apologies, everyone, this is the age of um, adaptation and COVID. Uh, so to the Tech Exchange support um, person, well, Colin, you can share the slides since you have access. Let's do that. Yeah, I'm pulling up slides right now. Excellent, thank you very much. Oh, I just got them. <laughs> You're seeing well, them. Perfect, well, Colin can share them. Um, like I said, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fernanda Zermoglio and I work for USAID at this time, but I'm going to present to you a lot of the work that we've done uh, through a USAID project called the Adaptation Thought Leadership and Assessment Project um, that really has been looking at the impacts of climate on, on vector-borne and waterborne illnesses. Next slide, please, Colin. I'd really like to do three things is, um, you know, kind of begin with why we care about climate risks and where the opportunities might be, and then provide two examples of two different vectors or two different mosquitoes and how they um, can, um, how our analytics work can support um, informed early warning, and then provide another example of, of, of still one final activity that we have within the Atlas project um, that is continuing on uh, early warning and early detection in Ethiopia. So next slide, please. So just to set the stage, um, many have said that health, global health is, is, the, is the face of climate change moving forward. And there's some data on the slide that shows that an additional 250,000 people or deaths are, are projected to um, happen at, on an annual basis due to malaria, a combination of factors, malaria, diarrheal disease, heat stress, and malnutrition. Um, and the effects of climate change are, are significantly costly uh, to, you know, to the tune of two to four billion dollars a year by 2030. Next slide, please. But with those big risks also come huge opportunities. So on this slide, what you see on the very right hand side is the total overall risk that climate poses to climate, both in the present as well as in the near term. And we'll focus on those two. So the full orange line, including the stipples, is the total risk. You can see that presently the risk is high, um, but the stippled lines are the potential that we can reduce that risk or sort of the opportunities for reducing that risk if we put in adaptation uh, practices in place, such as the ones that you see here, working on water and sanitation, mapping uh, vulnerability and identifying hotspots, kind of reducing our distance space, thinking about health systems, um, strengthening, et cetera. And most importantly is thinking about the near term. So not today, but in the future, we really do have an opportunity to reduce the risk quite significantly by over 50% from high to, to low. And this is where a lot of the analytics that we have been doing is focused on. So next slide, please. So in terms of vectors, um, there are obviously um, clear climate relationships between, um, 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 sorry, clear climate associations with mosquitoes and the environment because they live on, in the environment. So what you see on the screen here is essentially experientially derived uh, uh, physiological response curves for traits of, of relevance to um, malaria or other um, uh, sort of vector characteristics will respond um, in terms of um, additional burdens. So you see here that there's definitely a response curve around the biting rate. So as it gets hotter, um, the Anopheles mosquito bites more. It's much more effective within a certain temperature range at kind of transmitting the disease and it reproduces faster. Next slide, please. So understanding that context, um, we did a, a couple of analytics trying to understand um, how we provide targeted and detailed information on both sort of where malaria is going to potentially increase or shift in response to rising temperatures and also when that will happen. And that kind of ties back into the now versus the 2030. The first study I'm going to present to you is, is a study that really focused on three questions, like what, where are new areas going to appear, uh, particularly in Africa, 
and where will um, existing areas of, are perhaps seasonal um, will increase and become more um, sort of yearly um, endemic uh, areas and where will suitability decrease? Because all of these questions really have implications for the way we um, manage our resource and responding to it. And most importantly, obviously, is really how many people will be affected by, by these changes. So I'm going to just give you a very high level overview of some of the results of the study. And we can focus um, the, the following panel discussion on, on some of your questions. So next slide, please, Colin. This slide is a bit busy, um, but what it may, means just to, to tell you is that we know that um, there are many areas that are currently unsuitable for malaria now from sort of that response curve perspective in terms of uh, moisture and temperature, uh, but there will be new areas where perhaps a, a naive population um, where people have no immunity to the disease um, can, can um, be exposed to new malaria risks. And, and, and that naive population obviously has no, um, uh, no uh, built, no inherent immunity. And so the opportunity here in these new areas of, of endemism is to really target and concentrate surveillance at the edges of the range um, as a way of, um, Kind of controlling potential outbreaks and reducing the risks of novel outbreaks. So we have a full of Africa kind of context, but you see the very specific blue, purple, and green areas that will become endemic where there's a naive population and the opportunities for us to kind of focus and concentrate our efforts in those spaces is quite high. Next slide, please. Um, Again, sort of uh, the, the, the relationship or the increase in these potential areas of suitability are clearly tied to where people live, um, right? And this is uh, an analysis that shows or a, a chart that shows the number of people at risk. From the bottom side is a series of climate models um, across different time periods. So RCP 4.5 is a, a moderate climate inch or a moderate temperature increase, where uh, RCP 8.5 is, is a significant temperature increase. So it, as you can see from the slide, even in the 2030s, we're looking at the tune of you know, somewhere around two to 10 million people uh, potentially affected or potentially sort of entering these areas of high exposure uh, where they have no immunity. And that is an opportunity for us. To, um, to begin to target our, our efforts within USAID in that space. So next slide, please. And again, just kind of reading the point, the implications for these new areas of emerging suitability is that where people have no immunity, one outbreak can, can really lead to an epidemic, especially among uh, the vulnerable, vulnerable groups such as the elderly or women and children. And we all know that um, exposure to malaria before the age of five, five can have a significant implications on kind of developmental outcomes with, for which we're interested in. So being able to identify these hotspots helps us target and concentrate our surveillance so that we can control epidemics before they happen. Next slide, please, Colin. Now, um, what I'd like to do is just shift gears and recognize that not all uh, uh, diseases are, are um, propagated by the same mosquito. We have, for example, an example for, uh, so we know that the Anopheles mosquito is the one that is principally uh, responsible for malaria um, transmission, but the Aedes mosquito, um, the cool one and the hot one, so they have a different temperature range, is responsible for other um, uh, 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 vector-borne illnesses. And I'll go through one example here. Next slide, please of how we use the similar um, response curves to map out what we call zikun dengue, which is you know, Zika, uh, chikungunya, and dengue uh, transmission suitability across, um, across the world. And I'll just point you to the bottom part of the map to show that there are definitely areas where as temperatures rise, the, um, the suitable climate for these vectors will extend into other areas, for example, um, in, in the Amazon basin, it's definitely going to push into um, the lower ranges of the Amazon. We're seeing it, we're, we're likely to see an increase in that suitability across um, the 
central and, and western part of, of Africa and definitely in, in parts of southern Asia. So if you have a kind of a, or if you're able to compare the maps, those are the hotspots of potential risk by 2050. Next slide, please. And one final chapeau that I'd like to put on, on some of the work that we're doing is, is called um, the Epidemia System. So Epidemic Prognostic Incorporating Disease and Environmental Monitoring for Integrated Assessment System. It's, um, it's actually a, an early warning system with, that was developed by the University of Oklahoma. Um, and we have been working with the University of Oklahoma to um, identify opportunities for scaling that early warning and early um, detection of forecasts. It's driven by um, Earth observing satellite data. So a lot of the environmental data, the climate parameters, the moisture parameters are fed into a, a model that I will explain to you uh, moving forward. But it was piloted in the, originally in the Amhara region of Ethiopia. And we've been doing some work to see how that can ex be extended out to other parts of Ethiopia and hopefully also to other parts of, of, of the African continent. Next slide, please, Colin. So this slide is very busy, but I'd like to just walk you through it. On the very top part of the slide, it's a very simplified workflow for the epidemia system. Basically what happens is we um, get weekly, um, and with apologies for the screaming in the background, this, these are COVID times, we get, we get weekly epidemiological malaria incidence data from the Regional Health Bureau. Um, we then use some super magical um, coding to download the relevant um, and aligned timing of environmental data, that's um, soil moisture, uh, climate and weather parameters, such as rainfall and temperature. And um, using those two data sets on the fly, calculate what is called a genetic algorithm that kind of relates the malaria outbreaks to the, the climate data in real time. And, prov and provides um, a, a series of forecasted reports. On the bottom part of the chart is some of the work that we're doing with stakeholders within Ethiopia to really understand if you have an early warning of eight weeks, is what we can do with an epidemia, what are the potential responses from a public health perspective that can, um, that, that can be taken given that information? So what you see here is that with a, you know, at the Cabello or the health post uh, scale and the health center scale, which is the whatever scale, a one month um, early warning, early detection really uh, allows uh, for um, kind of locally making, uh, uh, making strategic decisions around how to lo locally target uh, obviously limited resources. And our hope of course, is to be able to, to look at um, using similar models at longer lead times and how commodities um, and can be affected by a changing climate. So just a, a quick overview on that. Next slide, please, Colin. And I'm going to end with this slide just by saying that, you know, the, uh, the, we have a series of outputs uh, within the epidemia model. Uh, one of them are just alert maps. These are maps saying these are, the incidences here are higher than normal. Um, they are in response to the climate um, parameters, um, which you see on the right-hand side. And then there's a, a series of charts around early and early detection, again, up to eight to 12 weeks um, out into the future um, that, that, that provide some insights on, on how uh, climate is affecting malaria incidents, but also perhaps on where uh, responses would be most effective. So I will just close with the next slide and just say that um, we have a series of studies available on our USAID climate, uh, climate portal, which is climate links. Uh, most of these studies are here. The um, epidemia model that I, I mentioned on early morning in, in Ethiopia is actually still uh, being finalized, but we look forward to hearing from you on your experiences um, in, in this space and are happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Fernanda, for that excellent presentation. Uh, we do, I know there was a lot of information there um, and we do have a couple minutes for questions or comments. As you're thinking about those, please feel free to just um, come off of mute and jump right on in. 
Um, but someone had asked about the slides and I believe they will be um, posted to the event website after the conference. So they should be available there in a day or two. Any questions for Fernanda? And if questions pop up as um, we're going through the rest of the, the session, then that's fine as well. Please um, put them in the chat um, or we'll open it up for discussion, of course, at the end. Um, for the next uh, portion of the session, I'll turn it over to um, Colin Quinn to introduce some panelists we have um, to hear a bit about their various perspectives working on vector-borne diseases. Colin? Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, before we go there, there's a quick question, I believe, for Fernanda in the in the chat, what exactly is meant by vector competence? Yeah, so um, vector competence um, is, is just related to a, a variable that we call R0. It's about the vector's ability to, um, together with the uh, parasite, to transmit the disease. So if you're biting more, if you are reproducing faster, your, your ability to, to transmit the disease is, is increased over. Great, thanks again, Fernanda. Um, as Liz mentioned earlier, my name is Colin Quinn. I work in the Africa Bureau at the US Agency for International Development on climate change. And over the last few years, I've worked on trying to help health programs when they're interested or with their outcomes by um, mainstreaming climate information and climate services into their work. So Fernanda and I have done a lot of this work together and I'm really excited to see the people who are here at our, um, at our session today. And before I introduce the panelists, I think we have a relatively small group. There's only about 25 of us on the call. And you guys have great experience, great questions, and we're really curious about your perspectives from the field. So I hope our panel discussion is um, more of a discussion and not just us talking at the audience. So I really encourage you to participate and I'm gonna to try to facilitate that the best I can. So thank you again for joining. And if you haven't already, please just put your name and where you work and what your interests are in the G chat and thank you for those of you that already have. Um, so now turning to our panels, to our panelists, um, we're really excited about the panel we have today. Um, Amelin Sheikh is the malaria advisor for USAID in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Um, and she has long been a champion of mainstreaming and integrating climate change into her work, both now and also when she worked for the Emerging Threats Division in USAID's Global Health Bureau. Um, Rodina Sobiatu is a data scientist with the President's Malaria Initiative. Um, she has worked extensively on that last example that Fernanda mentioned about setting up an early warning system for malaria in Ethiopia that includes, um, that includes climate and weather satellite data. And then lastly, Natalie Machuga is a health officer, a health officer in the, and she's also the deputy, deputy chief in the Office of Neglected Tropical Diseases. And Natalie has, work, has worked extensively, extensively on limiting climate risk to her work through, climate, through a process called climate risk management that USAID uh, goes through for all their projects and activities. And Fernanda may have to drop off a little bit earlier, but I'm gonna include her as long as, she, as, long as we can have her. Um, so Fernanda, thanks, thanks for your time. So I'm gonna go through each panelist and give you guys, a, please feel free to introduce yourself a bit more, but um, I'm gonna start with Rodina. So Rodina, can you tell us a bit more? Can you expand a bit more on the work in Ethiopia? I'm especially interested in how it came about um, and how you think it can help fit into broader malaria elimination efforts that are going on in the country. So over to you, Rodina. Sure, thanks, Colin. Uh, so this epidemia work really come at the request of the Ethiopia Health Minister and the PMI work with the NMCP, which is the National Malaria Control Program in Ethiopia and the Ethiopia Public Health Institute. So they wanted to replicate, replicate the climate-based early warning system that the University of Oklahoma had developed in the Amhara region. Uh, and they, uh, the University of Oklahoma had the uh, developed this maybe about 10 years ago from uh, NIH funding and the uh, Ethiopia government would like to expand this to other regions, to Oromia and to develop a roadmap to scale uh, the system nationwide. And the goal is to help Ethiopia, 
there will be a better allo allocate malaria control interventions where they are most needed. So for example, in preparation for increased demand for malaria services, the NMCP and regional health offices can preposition additional commodities such as I ITN, AC, which is the bed nets, uh, uh, and also the drugs, uh, and also the test kit, the RDT and the ACT to the districts where it, any malaria upsurge are expected. So again, this is this will be really helpful in elimination efforts that you will be able to, with the 12 week, currently with the 12 weeks uh, lead time that uh, there'll be there'll be some a little bit time for the uh, health officers to be able to shift some of the commodities. And lastly, in the context of climate changes, it is expected that we will see more extreme weather events. So this can affect the ecology of mos mosquito populations. And then typically there's a lag between the weather event and the mosquito populations and also the malaria outbreaks. So the framework of epidemia really take advantage of this lag and it can be reflected in some of the um, early warning or, uh, and then uh, so that, it can potentially inform us of any upsurges due to these weather events and again help in prepositioning commodities. So this is helpful to keep areas that already have low malaria burden not to be severely affected uh, by the extreme weather event and this which could put drawback in the elimination efforts. So uh, and over back to you Colin. Great thanks so much Rodina and I think we could talk about this specific example from Ethiopia for the whole session. And I'm, I'm also curious to hear from the audience if they think this is something that could be used in the countries that they work. Because I see we have a pretty diverse uh, geogra geographic area where folks work. Um, over to you, Amelin. So your work on implementing uh, malaria programs in Latin America and the Caribbean, what sort of climate services, climate information, or forecasts would be useful for you for those specific geographic areas. Yeah, thanks, Colin. And I think, you know, um, jumping off of what Radina mentioned, the context in Latin America and the Caribbean is a little different in that um, for malaria specifically, we have primarily P. vivax and P. falciparum um, in very localized um, municipalities across the region. And so, you know, we're in this race to treat P. vivax and falciparum and, and really reach elimination across the region before those longer term climate change impacts really um, affect the range of um, mosquito uh, ecology and, and that range of transmission. Um, that said, when we're thinking about places um, such as Central America, really linking that data on extreme climate events with um, the data on transmission um, and prevalence in order to equip ministries of health to be better prepared for outbreaks is super critical. The other piece that, um, you know, kind of, differentiates the region when we're thinking about South America is the more shorter term um, sets of data, for example, on things like land use change and, and their links to um, increased transmission events, um, primarily thinking about extractive industries, um, changes in land cover due to agriculture that do um, in the shorter term drive uh, that environment for um, mosquitoes to really um, breed and, and succeed. Um, but then, you know, in the longer term do contribute to um, those evolutions in, in terms of um, where we might have transmission in settings that um, we don't really focus on right now. So I think really one of the things that's missing is, is being able to layer the entomological assessments that we have ongoing um, that are driving vector control measures with um, some of the both short-term climate event data um, and then kind of those longer-term forecasts to really make sure that we're dealing with approaching elimination, um, but also preparing for what could come um, in the longer term future. And then obviously for um, those 80s mosquitoes that transmit Zika, chikungunya, dengue, um, obviously it is, I think, definitely more, again, more of that use of data at the Ministry of Health level um, across countries, across Central and South America, um, and even the Caribbean, um, truly identify and, and prepare for those outbreaks more rapidly and readily. Yeah, thanks, Amelin. You make a, gr a really good point. I feel like a lot of the programs I work on are designed over you know, the three or five year period and they want results immediately. So thinking about the long-term goals is something that doesn't always align in my, in my experience with the, um, with the programs we designed. So that, that's a great point. Um, Natalia, over to you. Have you seen changes in specific um, neglected tropical diseases 
due to any climate impacts, whether those are increased temperatures, changing rainfall patterns. Um, and I believe you work on, and you work on supply, supply change quite a bit. So I wonder how you would anticipate this changes, um, how, you, how supply chains are provided for, for neglect, neglected tropical diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I want to make a small point, um, jumping off on what Amelia said, because she made a really, really good point about Latin America. Not only are we racing to save lives and prevent malaria, but this is that we also have to look at the economic impact of how much will it cost the U.S. government to invest in these programs if malaria increases and if malaria advances to other areas that we haven't, that we're not currently present in. Um, but to answer your question, we have some really interesting examples in the neglected tropical diseases world. Um, we work in lymphatic filariasis, um, which is transmitted by the same mosquito that transmits malaria. Um, so in Nepal, we're seeing um, new areas affected by malaria which has an impact in our program because then we have to go in and check if those mosquitoes that are transmitting malaria are also transmitting lymphatic filariasis. And we have invested um, lots of money, lots of resources in getting um, lymphatic filariasis illuminated. So we don't want countries to reach illumination. And then because of um, mosquitoes expanding and people that have not gotten these diseases and do not have immunity to these diseases later be affected by a disease that we thought could go away. And in the supply chain, um, also a very interesting example, um, we, um, the Neglected Tropical Diseases Program at USAID works with donated drugs. Um, we work with many pharmaceutical companies, one of them being Pfizer. Pfizer has um, an acetromycin plant in Puerto Rico. And when we were thinking about what are the things that can affect supply chains, you know, you think about what can happen usually in country, in the countries that we're operating in. Um, you know, you could have um, floods or outbreaks or other things that, um, that take away resources um, from our neglected tropical diseases program. Um, but we never uh, looked into what could affect the, uh, the actual manufacturing of the drugs. So when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, we actually ended up seeing three to four months delays in the production of the drug that we needed to get to implement our programs. Um, so it, um, it allowed us to see that something that maybe before we would have thought about it as just um, a programmatic delay, it was really due to these changes and this adverse climate change events. Thank you, Natalia. That's really, yeah, it's really interesting to think about supply chains and how supply chains are going to be impacted. Um, so I want to open it up. I see, I actually see, looks like Mary mentioned that she works quite a bit in Latin America too, so she might have some reactions for, for you, Amelin and, and, and Natalia. But I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience now, and I see that Amelia has a question. I believe it's for Radina. So Amelia, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just wanted to find out, I was interested in whether or not epidemia would be useful. Um, um, I, I've seen, you know, how it has been used, for instance, with temperature change to predict areas where vectors might um, expand to and areas where the, you, you expect them to decline. But I'm wondering, for instance, um, how does it help in flood prone areas? flood prone areas when you have extreme events. You know, you mentioned Hurricane Katrina and all that. Um, in areas that get flooded, one of the aftermaths is that you have pockets of um, stagnant water that could potentially become breeding sites if you have an infected uh, vector um, in the region. So I'm wondering, does it help with the extreme events? And um, is, would epidemia also be useful to port health authorities? You know, because part of the role of the port health officer is to um, manage um, vectors 
within the perimeter of the airport up to about 400 uh, meters. So I'm just wondering, um, and it's important because we don't want to import um, new vectors into the place. That's why we have this insection. But we can't get it right all the time. So I'm wondering, is there any advantage that epidemia could offer in the case of extreme events and in the case of port health, managing vector control? Um, thank you for your questions, uh, Amelia. So I, I think I'll try to answer that. Uh, so for epidemia, it, uh, it does include the rainfall information in um, providing uh, the early, war uh, early warning for malaria. So, uh, it, but also with malaria, I, I think it's uh, the tricky part is too much water can wash out the breeding site. So it really depends on the, on the amount of the rainfall. And so this will tie to the how, how the model is uh, calibrated or how the model is designed. Uh, we are hoping that uh, this could, uh, epidemia with the rainfall information, it can help inform us where the pockets are for, uh, for malaria outbreaks uh, due, to, due, to, uh, due to the flooding, or does it really manifest into, into outbreak or not? Uh, but again, this really depends on the data that they have and how good it is uh, so that it can capture all, all the relationship. And we have yet to to test this, but it has the potential. And especially if it if it uses any rainfall uh, forecast, uh, and the forecast is uh, is good enough, then yes, it will be. I think it will be uh, helpful in identifying identifying hotspots or pockets uh, that's affected by the extreme events. And as for the Port Health Authority, it can be useful. It can be used as a uh, as a information for situational awareness. Uh, and but again, uh, then you will you will need like a, l large maps on uh, on every area in order to be able to uh, uh, to use it uh, at the full potential. So, uh, but I think uh, it might have some uh, uh, usefulness to that. Uh, and I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Yeah, Amelia, does that answer your question or any follow up? Oh, it looks like, yeah, in the chat, you said thank you. Okay, sounds good. So any other questions for our panelists before we kind of open it up to folks' experiences in the field and what they, what they would like to share? And feel free to put a question in the chat or raise your hand or, um, or just speak up. So Mary, it looks like you have a question. Do you wanna, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, hi, I'm Mary Schooler here. Um, so I was wondering kind of like during times with increased temperatures, um, do we see a lack of adherence to using mosquito nets with some of my experience in Belize? Um, often a complaint for people was that it's too hot <laughs> and they um, were advised to use thing, you know, fans like moving air, things like that. Um, but can epidemia like predict kind of these heat waves and maybe assist countries preparing for this lack of adherence um, in different ways? Amelin, you might be best place to answer that. Yeah, so um, I would say in terms of, you know, the lack of adherence and, and risk, um, risky behaviors. So one alternative um, and something that like a specific activity that USAID uh, LAC is currently supporting is a study in um, Colombia's Galga region of um, essentially utility we're doing both assessment of um, bed nets and IRS, as well as a um, social study to understand kind of um, knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors as in regards to the use of, of bed nets um, and also kind of um, opinions and thoughts on use of IRS. Really, you know, one question is what is the better or, you know, more effective intervention? Um, a lot of times, you know, families do indicate that they'd rather have their houses sprayed. Um, you know, perhaps one of those reasons is because they'd rather have their houses sprayed than, um, you know, deal with bed nets in higher temperatures. So, you know, one question is kind of um, based on, you um, 
what is breeding, what is what mosquitoes are, are circulating in the region, um, taking kind of that step back in terms of vector control. Um, but I definitely, you know, I, I guess, you know, that question of epidemia predicting more of those long-term changes um, is potentially something that um, I would kick back to Radina um, in terms of, you know, can USAID PMI or, or USAID in terms of our malaria programming um, consider linking up with the um, behavior change data that we're, you know, can gather from our differing studies. Uh, in terms of predict predicting heat waves, uh, the model does have a temperature, but it's not uh, air temperature, it's land surface temperature. Uh, it could predict uh, heat waves, but it might, the lead time might be shorter. Uh, I think I've seen some model for, for heat waves uh, and it could be incorporated, uh, but, but the lag time might not be sufficient enough uh, to, to prepare for, for lack of adherence, so. Yeah, I think both, both, both of you and Mary bring up great points. First, first on the behavior change. In Africa, for example, we often, when, we, um, when bed nets are distributed to fisher folk communities, they're often used for, to, for fishing um, as opposed to, to bed nets. So I think that behavior change aspect is, is, a, is a big challenge. Um, and then just hearing, you know, from my perspective where I sit working on climate change, what the needs are for forecasts, whether it's heat wave forecast or seasonal per precipitation forecast is, is really helpful. Um, and what, what sort of um, timeframes are most useful is also helpful. So thanks, Mary. Any other questions for our panelists? All right, well, I'm looking forward to, I think we have a few more minutes here. So hopefully we can have a quick conversation about how climate impacts your work. So I was hoping that folks from the audience could share some of their experiences. Um, we have a great group here. And like I said, we have a relatively small group. So I think we can facilitate a good conversation and everyone can contribute if they're interested about how climate may impact their work or if they have examples of um, how climate may have been mainstreamed into their work. So I'm just gonna open it up. I have an example to share if you all don't mind listening. Uh, I'm Patrick Weston. Uh, I spent uh, four years working in the Southern Philippines. Uh, with regards to vector-borne diseases, uh, two, occur two uh, experiences come to mind. The first is which um, I had a team operating at about a half a mile above sea level and their medical advisor uh, had instructed the team to not concern themselves with uh, malaria prophylaxis because of the temperature and the height above sea level. Well, after the end of the deployment, four of the five team members returned to the United States with dengue because they didn't, they adhered to the medical advisor's advice. And so they were lured by the fact that, uh, again, the fact that they were half a mile above sea level and that temperatures rarely straight above 71 Fahrenheit, that kind of lulled them into this complacency where they felt that they didn't have to take prophylaxis. Uh, the other example I have, uh, I was conducting uh, some medical treatment facility assessments in Western Luzon in the Northern Philippines. And I noticed that there were about a hundred US service members all in the hospital waiting room. And I asked my tour guide, why are there so many US service members sitting here? And she said, well, they all, they've all contracted malaria. And I said, how is that possible? She says, well, apparently whoever planned the exercise did not anticipate that uh, vector-borne diseases can be transmitted during the dry season. And so you had a bunch of US soldiers crawling around in the ground in the fields and the hills of Western uh, Luzon who were disturbing uh, mosquitoes and attracting malaria. They had been told that they didn't need to concern themselves with vector-borne disease transmission because they were operating during the dry as opposed to the wet season. And so those are just two examples that came to mind uh, having sat in and listened to the panels. And so uh, when I became an instructor, uh, one thing I would tell my students is to you have to factor climate change into your uh, pre-deployment medical assessments. Don't just assume that you're going to have higher rates of disease transmission during the wet season when clearly we're seeing not only is the disease being transmitted at higher elevations and cooler climates, but it's also being transmitted during dry seasons as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great 
example, Patrick. Thank you. Um, really useful. It, it reminds me a bit of a question that I get quite quite often is, you know, how accurate are your are your predictive models? For example, how accurate is epidemia? And um, you know, we have to be really careful, I think, about describing how accurate our models are and how accurate our predictions are, because it, when we when and if we fail um, on those predictions, it um, you know it, it causes the climate community to lose a little bit of credibility. And my one of my main messages is, you know, climate is one of several dri drivers of how, as as we all know, of how um, um, infectious and vector-borne diseases are are transmitted. Um, so we have to take into account all of this climate information with several other drivers, whether that's human migration um, or other things. So yeah, thanks a lot for sharing that, Patrick. Um, would anyone else like to share an example or have questions or a follow up for Patrick maybe? I have a quick question, kind of comment. Um, and thank you, Patrick, for sharing. Um, this may or may not relate to you, but um, I do think I'm curious about, you know, the in, indoor spraying and, and spraying in general, like we're talking about climate change um, and those, obviously those sprays and things do have an environmental impact. And a lot of like people who we were working with in Belize thought that it was useless. It only helped cockroaches. Um, a lot of times Belize would spray actually outdoor rather than indoor but like um they would often cough like the health risks to themselves was very difficult um as well as just like their perception of what those health risks and then also the effect on the environment of having you know these sprays what is happening to kind of like mitigate that either with that development or like are there other ways that um communities can like not spray but still um address the vector and those environmental impacts of that spraying. So I can give kind of a, a quick example or kind of thinking through that is really one, ensuring that the susceptibility assessments are being made for those sprays so that they're not being used, um, you know, indiscriminately um, without kind of um, that targeted sense of their actual utility and, and they're actually working on controlling mosquito populations in households. Um, you know, I think the other piece, again, it goes back to, to really being able to, to have that and to assessment, understanding what are the, um, you know, the species and the populations that are breeding in the locations where you are, you know, trying to implement your vector control strategy. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have, I can't say much um, in terms of, you know, what, you um, kind of that longer, shorter term environmental impact is. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of it really is effective communications that are, you know, open, honest, um, and consistent with the communities where uh, sprays are being um, utilized. And so that's one of those things where it's kind of a balance between, yes, what donor community implementing projects might be doing, um, whether it is in terms of response or in terms of research, um, but then also going back to the municipality level, like Secretaria de Salud or, you know, ministries of health, um, and really kind of working together to facilitate that open communication um, to understand, you know, what the community's perspectives are on the use of those sprays um, and, you know, also what their behaviors might be in terms of um, bed net usage or, or other behaviors um, that they're, you know, taking to prevent their and lower their risk of transmission. Um, but definitely a really good question, I think, in terms of, of that longer term environmental consideration. Um, that you know, here at USAID, we can we can bring back um, to to explore further with our vector control team. Great, thanks. thanks. So Natalia or Dina, would you like to add anything? I think Amelin, great answer. Thank you. Um, so we only have, only have a few minutes left. I just want to turn back to the panelists for one final question before I hand it back to you, Liz, to close us out. Um, so my question is, you know, I'm going to make an, an assumption. Um, my assumption is, since you're on this panel, and because I know know you and know your interests, I'm going to assume that you think considering climate change will um, improve the outcomes of your projects and activities. So assuming that, um, what are the barriers that you see, or what is one or two? What are one or two barriers for mainstreaming or integrating climate into your work? Um, and Natalia, let's start with you. I think 
for us is looking at um, in, in neglected tropical diseases control is like looking at things holistically and always including climate change when we're thinking about our interventions and how we're planning to reach people. We work in, um, in mass um, distribution campaigns. Um, so climate, not just vectors, but climate in general can have a lot of um, a lot to do when when we're reaching people, how many people we're able to reach, are those communities moving around, are the supply chain, um, is supply chain affected by anything that's happening elsewhere in the world? Um, so for us, um, over the last three to five years, when we have um, awarded new contracts and new um, and new awards we have really, really been thinking about um, not just like what are, what climate change adverse events specifically, but more um, as, you know, kind of incorporating um, climate change into everything that, um, everything that we're doing. Um, but in terms of, in terms of barriers, um, just the fact that um, there has been, there has been so much, um, um, you know, hesitancy to include climate change until now. And, you know, that's me just being, being honest. And um, now we feel, I think everybody's like looking at this and kind of we're ready to work in it again. <laughs> Over. Yeah, that, that, thanks for the honesty. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think right now is a great opportunity to include climate change in ways that are useful. So good point. And you also make a good point about you know how global weather patterns or an extreme event on in one part of the world can affect supply chains in another part of the world. Um, Amon, same question over to you. Yeah, um, and this is something that I am always kind of um, biting my tug about in terms of you know when we think about climate change and vector-borne diseases, um, you know we get our money by way of earmarks and very specific delineated and defined appropriations um, that tell us you must and are only allowed to use your money for X, Y, Z reasons. When we think about um, you know PMI and and its history. Um, it, it's essential, right? You know, we need to, to really target malaria. Um, but I think when we think about these other vector-borne diseases like dengue, like Zika, um, a lot of the efforts, um, at least in terms of U.S. government, um, USAID specifically, um, can generally only take place in an emergency context. So it's only when we have, you know, a massive outbreak um, of this vector-borne disease and we need to tackle it as the emergency because it's affecting the rest of our programming um, that we can address it. One, um, you know, big uh, hindrance and challenge is this kind of inability to work, I think, more cross, um, both cross sectorally, but then also, you know, cross disease wise in terms of our funding and the way that we um, are able to implement our efforts. So, you know, I think one thing is, um, for us thinking creatively about how the rest of our investments um, you know, cross sectorally in terms of surveillance, in terms of um, diagnostics, and further upstream in terms of thinking about those environmental drivers of transmission. Um, you know, are kind of the the big question to to answer, um, and and the big kind of flexibility to find. So, if anybody has advice on further creative thinking around that, I think we we can all welcome it. Yeah, thanks, Alan. And yeah, I mean, if there's co-benefits of work on climate, like from malaria that you can take to other, um, you know, tropical diseases or vector waterborne diseases, I think that's a great, great, um, great advice. Uh, Rodina, over to you. Okay. Uh, so I think for the uh, longest time uh, with PMI, with us, uh, the 27 countries that we're looking into, um, uh, to begin with, it was difficult to find uh, to bring in all these data sets uh, for all 27 countries at the right administrative level, at the right uh, resolution, and choosing the data which one is more appropriate and which one is more um, with, with a good quality. So we're working towards that, and we have a system in place right now to to have uh, the climate information. But I think right now just trying to put that into some kind of analytics, uh, also using the malaria data in which the quality is questionable uh, because of, you know, it's different country have different practices. And then if we have the analytics, how, uh, how can we trust the results? How do we know that, you know, 
two months lag uh, uh, of rainfall is really uh, the case that we that we can use uh, uh, for our prediction. So, so things uh, more on the uh, on that side. So, and back to you, Colin. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, really good point, Radina. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Amelia puts a good put a um, a good comment in the chat about the lack of work on in the health sector on climate resilience or climate data. And there was actually a study done about five years ago that looked at across sectors and if it looked at several different sectors and in each sector it looked at if there was climate adaptation work done in that sector how much could that sector's risk be reduced by and health's risk the, the risk to the health sector was actually more than the agriculture sector and more to the water sector it was the highest sector of any sector they looked at um, and this is specific to africa um, so and i think part of the reason is because climate has already been mainstreamed quite a bit into the ag sector as you mentioned amelia so I think there's huge opportunities to limit risk in, in the health sector. And I think we're kind of just scratching our surface. And um, as Natalia mentioned, it might be a great time to harness that, the, the, those opportunities right now. So thank you again, everybody. I'm going to hand it over to Liz. I uh, really appreciate the useful discussion. And thanks to our panelists. Um, really appreciate your insights. Over to you, Liz. Great. Thank you, Colin, for facilitating that discussion. And thank you all for um, you know, the excellent questions and comments, Mary and Amelia and Patrick for sharing your examples. It's, I mean, at one level, we talk about this data and these global trends, but then it's really helpful to ground that in these very specific local examples of people in very particular places, you know, getting maybe some wrong information or, you know, predictions or estimates that turn out not, um, not to be helpful to them. So thank you very much for all of that. And I really do, I also appreciate the, the comments about Amelia thinking about this, um, it seems like the integration of climate change information into health decision-making has lagged some other sectors. But in the past several years, it really seems to be gaining momentum. I know the Lancet um, countdown on climate and health, one of the indicators they track is the research coming out on climate change and health. And that has just been skyrocketing over the past several years. So it really seems like we're poised to do, to really take all of this work up a notch. And if different sectors can kind of get their data systems to talk to each other, different ministries and governments can work together. There are really a lot of good models. And we've heard a couple of examples of the work today that can really be applied um, to, in different places and for different purposes. So hopefully we can see more of that in the coming years. Um, and I see that there's some interest maybe in using epidemia in different applications of that. So yes, please follow up. We would love to work with you all. Um, but yeah, thank you very much to our panelists for sharing your thoughts and experiences. And thank you all for joining today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a lovely weekend. That is all for me. So thank you all. <laughs>